Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play This is my last letter Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Schumacast, a podcast exploring the films of Joel Schumacher. I am Noel. Joining me, as always, is Angie. Hello. How are you doing, Angie? I'm good. How are you? Oh, boy. We took a bit of a break in recording <laughs> for a couple of months just so I could catch up on editing and I have to shake the rust out a little bit. <laughs> right. <laughs> How do we do this again? <laughs> it was actually kind of nice just relaxing and not having to worry about prep work or anything. And then I got to this week and it's like, oh, wait, I booked two shows today. <laughs> Oops. And I do a lot of prep. So it's going to be a little bit of a busy weekend for me, but I think we're going to have some fun here. And we are being joined by one of our regular guests. Yes. A guest you've heard constantly, repeatedly, <laughs> and you all know his name, JD. Yay! <laughs> heard too much from me, most likely. No. No, I edit that out. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Editing is for removing the too much. <laughs> so we are here to discuss the 1983 film, co-written and directed by Joel Schumacher, DC Cab. I have a question. Yes. Where does this fit in the DC continuity? It, I, I... <laughs> it's before Crisis. Okay. But after Crisis. Because I kept expecting Space Cabby to come in, but he never showed up. It's set during one of the crises. It's before one of the crises, and it's after one of the crises. Okay, okay. But not during Zero Hour. <laughs> We're going to get to that with Cousins. Oh, dear. So DC Cab. Angie. Yes. Is DC Cab a film you had ever seen before? I don't think so. Nothing was familiar as I was watching it this time, so I don't think I'd ever seen it before, no. I'm not sure I've even heard of it. GD? I have never seen it before. I had heard of it, ironically, through a cabbie. When I was in Las Vegas, he was picking me up to take me to a friend's place, and he asked me where I knew this person from. And this was like the early 2000s, so everybody was a little suspicious of the internet still. Yeah. But he's like, I'm on the internet. My handle is DC Cabby. And I'm like, uh-huh. And he's like, you know where that's from, right? I'm like, no. He's like, DC Cab, man. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, you know, Mr. T, he was really like flabbergasted. I had never heard of this 1983 film, but it was made when I was like three years old. Yeah. yeah. So that's beginning and end of my real exposure to the film. It's always comforting hearing you say it was made when you were three, because this was made when I was one. <laughs> I was two. <laughs> so we got the full spectrum. One, yeah. two, three. Yeah. <laughs> I know I vaguely was aware of the existence of this movie. I don't remember the context, if it was just because of Mr. T or whatnot. Mm. Or, you know, my parents did have some of the premium movies channels back in the day. I know this was kind of a fixture on at least a couple of them. But I don't picture this as being a film that either of my parents would have really been fans of. So I don't know, maybe I just caught like some ads or something. But I kind of knew that it existed. And so even when I was starting the Schumacher prep research, I was like, oh, same guy did this in Car Wash. Okay, that kind of makes sense. Otherwise, I didn't know anything about it. So this was also my first time. Hmm. Getting into just a tiny little bit of history, I don't really have that much. As said, this was directed and written by Joel Schumacher. It was co-written by Topper Carew. Topper Crew, there was this brief time where it seemed like he was going to be emerging as a pretty major black producer of films made for a largely black audience. This is a film that he got through Universal, where Universal was trying to reach out and make smaller, lower to mid-budget productions for wider ethnic audiences. And this one was, hey, Car Wash was a hit. Let's get the guy who made Car Wash. But Michael Schultz was busy. <laughs> so let's get the guy who wrote Car Wash. He's black, right? <laughs> no. Not so much. <laughs> and I'm not saying that to be flippant. That's actually yeah. what happened. They did not That's know Joel thought. Schumacher was Joel Schumacher. <laughs> but he came in. They put together the story. Schumacher still got the directing gig. 
it should be pointed out, Joel almost quit directing after Incredible Shrinking Woman because while it's a film that you know, we liked and it was received well, mm. it was a real nightmare to make where he went from just doing very small productions to suddenly this big, effects-heavy, sprawling thing with A-list comedian and huge studio promotion behind it. And it was just overwhelming for him. It kind of really dove mm. in over his head and had a bit of an existential crisis. And when he was offered, hey, you want to go back and make a small comedy about a DC cab company? He's like, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a way to just kind of reorient and you know get his feet back on the ground. And the film, it was executive produced by the Goober Peters Company. This was when Universal was producing films through RKO Pictures. The old classic Hollywood mm. company <laughs> had come back during the 80s as an imprint of Universal. This was produced through the company Goober Peters, run by Peter Goober and John Peters. And I'm sure some people out there recognize the name John Peters. I had to do a double take when I saw that name in the credits. Mm. Do you all remember the story about when Kevin Smith was working on a Superman movie? Oh, yeah. And there was yeah. the crazy producer who wanted the giant spider in it. The giant robot <laughs> spider or whatever. Yeah. That's John Peters. <laughs> to be fair, John Peters, and especially with his partner Goober, they were pretty big names at the time. They were doing like... Like Clue, The Color Purple, Clan of the Cave Beer, which is Clan of the Cave Beer. Has anyone marketed that? <laughs> <laughs> Clan of the Cave Bear, Witches of Eastwick, Gorillas in the Mist. So they were pretty big. And then that culminated in Batman. And that's how John Peters kind of got tied up in a lot of the DC Comics rights, I think, to this day or until recently. See, mm -hmm. there's our DC connection. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's basically all I have in terms of the people involved in the background of the movie. And I'm sure we'll get through some of the other crew later on. And it should be pointed out, we'll get back to this at the end of the episode, because this is 1983 and Box Office Mojo begins at 1982. This is the first movie in the <laughs> Shumacast library where I actually have week to week box office info. Ooh. There we go. <laughs> Anything else to add before I jump into the synopsis? Nope. Nope. After the death of his father, Southern boy Albert Hockenberry heads to Washington, D.C. with the dream of starting a cab company, and his first stop is to become a driver for the rundown and ragtag company D.C. Cab, which is run by Harold Oswald, who served in Vietnam with Albert's father and is now a down-on-his-luck dreamer desperately trying to keep his company afloat, which isn't made easy by the eclectic group of drivers he's managed to get, who I'm sure we'll get into later. Through it all, Albert learns the ins and outs of the business, even as the company is constantly under threat from rival drivers and the local hack inspector, Ernesto Bravo. When Harold attempts to finally revamp the business with reward money from a recovered violin, his wife leaves him for Ernesto, taking the money with her, so Albert decides to invest in the company a healthy sum he had tucked away, allowing DC Cab to clean themselves up, grease the palms of local doormen, and get those airport licenses they've always been after. And through it all, Albert's managed to woo the underage waitress of his dreams. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything goes belly up when, making a regular stop at one of the embassies in D.C., Albert gets abducted during the kidnapping of an ambassador's children, and authorities are quick to believe he's one of the kidnappers. With Ernesto shutting down the business and their name now mud in the community, the drivers of DC cabs steal back their cars and track down the clues, eventually finding the farmhouse where Albert and the children are being held. During a big chase that ends with the kidnappers crashing through a drive-in theater screen, Albert and the kids are saved and DC cab become the heroes of the town with a huge parade and everything. So Angie. Yes. Do you recommend DC Cab? I do. It starts off a little slow, not necessarily in a bad way, but in a way that you might think that's going to be the pace of the entire film, and then it kind of becomes this madcap, crazy, fast-paced comedy, and it's wacky, it's zany, but it's full of a lot of really entertaining characters, and I enjoyed it a lot, and I can also pass on that it got the Jack Locke seal of approval as well, Yay. because <laughs> he was watching with me, and he's like, this is really funny. So better than Disorderlies. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> JD, do you recommend DC Cab? Yeah, I'm going to recommend it. I have some problems with it, but for the most part, it reminds me a lot of Car Wash, mm. but it has a plot and the characters are a little bit more developed. At least some of them are. That was my two big issues with Car Wash. But I agree with Angie. There's some really genuinely funny bits. And the end of it feels actually kind of zany and wacky. And you're actually kind of rooting for these guys. So yeah, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I'm a little on the fence, but just because this is Joel making like an early 80s raunchy R-rated comedy. Boy, does it cross some lines. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and there are some bits in it that are just so offensive. 
but a lot of the movie is really fun and inventive and lively. It's one of those casts that you can point a camera at them. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to give them a line or a scene. You just point a camera at this cast and wait, and it's going to be funny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they have so much fun playing off each other. The plot is silly, but in a good way, and it really builds up to a fun third act. And it's a really entertaining movie. It's very much a movie of its time. Oh, yeah. But again, the energy of it, the wackiness of it. It's a really fun watch. And there are several scenes in this that are some of the funniest bits I've seen in quite some time. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I did not look up any of the cast before I watched this movie. I read the script without looking up the cast. Mm. I had no idea we were into a movie starring 21-year-old Adam Baldwin. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> it took me a minute to recognize him, to be honest, with his long curly hair. I think I was like halfway through the film. I was like, I'd seen his name in the credits, but I'm so used to him looking like a military guy. <laughs> used to the big gruff Jane, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, that's him. <laughs> what did you think of his performance? He's not one of the funniest guys. I don't think he's an actor who's really good at being the youthful voice of optimism, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. To be honest, I don't think he's really as well developed as he should be because he's our nominal hero. We never get a reason as to why he wants to become a cabbie other than mm -hmm. his dad was friends with Harold. And yeah. that seems to be like the beginning and end of that characterization. Right. Yeah, this kind of idolization just built on a lot of backstory that we don't see. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think he's definitely in a lot of ways meant to be our through into this world so that, yeah, he's not very well defined, but I don't know that he necessarily has to be because he's mostly just a way for us to meet all these characters. And then why does he suddenly become so inspirational to turn them all around? I don't know. But I guess he's just so gosh darn plucky and cute that <laughs> they want to listen to him. I don't know. But he's fine in the role. They're definitely going for the everyman. But Adam Baldwin is one of those actors who I don't think ever fully worked until they found out exactly how to use him. Mm. And being the mm -hmm. charming, wide-eyed innocent <laughs> yeah. yeah, is just kind of weird. I mean, it's, he's not bad. He's not bad in the role. No. It's not a bad mm. character. He has some fun bits. Like, I love how everyone keeps accusing him of being chicken shit, and yet when he's being held up, he's the one to slam on the gas and say, I'm bringing in a guy he has got a gun <laughs> to my head. Right. It's a charming role, but again, he is kind of drowned out by just how over the top the rest of the cast is. Yeah. The other main character, really kind of as the central through line, is Max Gale as Harold, the guy who runs the company. He's fine. He's a little... <laughs> that one scene of him doing the flamethrower into the fireplace was like, yeah. whoa, okay, buddy. He's a bit kooky. Yeah, but he's a likable enough guy. Once again, it's not that he's not well-defined. He has a lot to do, but I guess being a sort of everyman means that I don't feel like I have as much to say about him. Yeah, he's the guy who's trying to keep this cast of characters together up until the point where Albert actually does that. So they're kind of serving similar roles. I mean, he's fine. I think you get some better joke moments than I think Albert ever does, like the flamethrower and the part where he throws Ernesto into the pool. He's the adult of the group, so he's not given as much to do as some of the other character actors. My big thing is I like that he has that mixture of constantly dreaming and wanting this to be a really great opportunity. We'll come together. We'll make this work while also having this kind of sadness to him that everything hasn't. Mm hmm. Yeah. It's been very crushing. He's gone out. He created his dream and all that stuff. And it's kind of fallen back on him because he's literally stuck with this weird ragtag group. I also just like the look of him because this actor, I remember he was on Barney Miller, mm -hmm. the old cop show back in the day. Mm. And he always had a really bad comb over. And I'm glad just <laughs> let the ball dome fly, man. <laughs> I can relate. <laughs> And he's a kooky Vietnam vet, but, you know, he's still a kooky Vietnam vet who came back and, you know, made his dreams come true until they haven't. Right. Right. And he's wearing like a Grateful Dead t-shirt. So I think he's got that one foot in the hippie world and one foot as the Vietnam vet. So which kind of shows like why he puts up with all these weirdos, but at the same time still tries to be the responsible figure to them. Mm. Yeah. One thing that did kind of interest me is I know this was designed to be a film that was made for and placed to a primarily black audience. Unlike Car Wash, it's not right. really a black film. No. And I'm actually just looking at the script. Harold and Myrna were written as black. Hmm. 
Mm. Everything else in the script is pretty much identical here. All the dialogue, all the scenes and all the bits. Mm -hmm. There's very little of this script that was changed, but I'm kind of surprised that they recast the ethnicity of Harold. I mean, it's a very diverse film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of diversity to it, but it's interesting that your two primary characters are now both white guys in a film that started as a film that was meant Mm -hmm. to be sold to black audiences. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if like behind the scenes there was some kind of a change or shake up or something. Mm -hmm. But I like that every time things go ahead, they then fall. You know, it's like, hey, we found the recovered violin. My wife left me and took all the money. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) There's a couple of times where I think he can get a little scary, like when Ophelia was going to leave the company. Yeah. I think he got a little overly forceful in holding her there as he tried to talk her into staying. Right, right. That was a little uncomfortable. Though I do like the bit when he comes back home and is literally just taking all of his stuff from the house. And he doesn't really want to get revenge on his wife and Ernesto. He literally just needs his stuff to sell for money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he's like, where's the flamethrower? And she just thinks he's going to burn the house down. (laughs) But what's weird is he recovers the flamethrower there, but we never use it in the third act. Yeah. Yeah, that's true, huh? Well, I wonder if, again, maybe there was like some kind of a budgetary reason. Could be. Because I don't even remember it being in the script. Hmm. So just kind of moving on. So we have the whole ragtag cast of characters. (laughs) JD, we'll start with you. Who among the ensemble was your favorite? Oh, geez. I mean, Tyrone has the biggest arc. He's kind of like the third lead after Albert and Harold. Mm-hmm. So why don't we just yeah. hold that question then and just, Tyrone's a very odd character. He is. Yeah. What'd you think of him? I like him. He feels like there's parts of his story that were cut though. Like we never find out why he wears the curlers other than he kind of talks like, oh, I had dreams and I had all this stuff. Like I get the impression that he wants people to think less of him, but it doesn't really ever seem to go anywhere. I don't quite understand what his storyline was supposed to be. I don't know if I missed something or if they just got cut. No, there wasn't anything missing from the script. Okay. He does remind me of, oh gosh, was it? Tracy Morgan? No. <laughs> Um, I'm talking about in Car Wash. Oh, I'm sorry. Abdullah. Abdullah, thank you. It's like very similar that he's a guy who he's black and he sees the place that people want to put him. He went to college. He tried to make something better of himself, but I guess he felt like he was being judged so much that he was just like, oh, screw it then. I'll be what you want me to be. I'll wear this goofy wig and I'll just be a cab driver. I'm sure it's a legitimate frustration that people have sometimes. And it's an interesting perspective. I do kind of feel like he should have a little bit more of a complete arc in a way, instead of just going from selling Uncle Sam things to suddenly wearing the fancy suit and helping to save the day. It does kind of feel like, wait, what made you turn around Mm -hmm. after you were kind of out of this for so long? But I think it's an interesting character. He brings a little bit more depth to what's otherwise a very silly and zany bunch (laughs) in a lot of ways. So it was interesting. I enjoyed him. Well, what changed was he got to finally meet Irene Cara. That's true. (laughs) (laughs) But is that enough? I don't know. Yeah, especially since that never goes anywhere. Mm Mm-hmm. Tyrone is frustrating because I think he is a very compelling character. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of really unspoken depth to him. Again, yeah, he has a lot of anger, a lot of bitterness. Mm -hmm. But the way he channels it is he's a lying con man. Mm -hmm. He screws over everyone. He steals from everyone. Even his entire image and persona is about messing with everyone's expectations. Yeah. And they really, really set up a lot of that. But yeah, in the payoff, it's just he takes off the wig, comes in a normal suit, and then rallies everyone to go save the day. And there's really no real further payoff of that because my other frustrating thing about Tyrone is he's so hyper and so (laughs) pouring out his anger and everything all the time. Mm -hmm. Like he's a guy I would never want to be in a conversation with because he's just going to (laughs) fly off the handle all the time. And even in the end when they're trying to save the day, it's like he's the guy who can't hold himself back as he runs out and screws up the entire facade, you know? Mm -hmm. He's so exhausting, I almost want to (laughs) say. (laughs) <laughs> you know, just as a person, he's just kind of an exhausting right. and toxic person, even though he's coming from a genuine place, you know? Mm-hmm. All of his scenes are just so weird. And even like the scene with them on the tracks, where it's like him and Albert are doing the whole prank driving on the train tracks and almost get run over by a train. Mm. He's trying to then brush that off as like, oh, it was just another one of my cons, just another joke, and then he passes out. Right. That's one of my favorite jokes in the movie, but... <laughs> it is, but it's just such an interesting thing of he can't not lie to everybody 
And it's mm-hmm. not that he's doing it out of trying to make money or all stuff. He's doing it out of bitterness. He hates everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe that's his arc that he ultimately finds friendship and companionship after he's done so much to just drive everyone away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it needed something to kind of instigate yeah. that. Like we said, it just decides like, oh, I'm loyal now. I'm going to help. Right. Right. Everyone else is like rallying to the cause and making yeah. the cab business better, but he wants to walk away. But then just because Albert's kidnapped, he feels different. I don't know. I don't understand why he's still hired there because he's so extreme all the time. <laughs> right. He doesn't seem to be making any money. And yeah, I love he's the one that quits. Right. <laughs> and then just before we move on to the rest of the cast, we should at least just bring up Irene Cara. He's such an obsessive fanboy about this one celebrity. It's the one thing that excites him and that he loves. And then he finally gets to drive Irene Cara to a hotel. And this, of course, Irene Cara, the star of Sparkle. Mm. So, of course, her and Joel knew each other. The one big change from the script is that that role was written as Diana Ross. Oh, okay. I don't think Diana Ross was ever going to say yes to this project. (laughs) (laughs) Probably not. You know, Diana Ross was in lots of 80s sex comedies, right? Yeah. (laughs) She was in Police Academy and Porky's and... (laughs) uh, Porky's too. Yeah. yeah. Klaus, right, yeah. Yeah. God. (laughs) And then there was one extra cut bit where her whole thing is that she's performing at the White House. Right. We were actually going to see that as the parade celebrating the heroes takes them to the White House where they get to sit in as Diana Ross performs. Okay. Mm. That ultimately didn't happen. Yeah. I gotta be honest, I really like the soundtrack in this movie. The Irene Cara song kind of sucks. <laughs> it is terrible. We were kind of making fun of, I can't remember now what da, Jack da, da, was da, da, doing, da, but he was da, riffing da. off of it because it's, <laughs> it gets stuck in your head, but not in a good way. I was going to say, like, it's not good, but it's an earworm. Like, I can yeah. hear it in my head right now. Mm-hmm. It's really that it's written and produced by the same people who did I've Got a Feeling for her, the one mm-hmm. from Flashdance. That makes sense. It's got a similar sound. But that's such a better song. It is. Yeah. <laughs> So, J.D., so who is your least favorite character in the cast? Oh, I don't understand Baba, Bill Maher's character. Mm. Because there's nothing mm. to him that I found funny. So, like, Bill Maher. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I say this as someone who used to be an avid fan of Bill Maher and yeah. just got exhausted by it. Oh, I used to love watching Politically Incorrect way back in the day, but I don't really care for him too much anymore. Mm. And maybe that is part of why I'm lumping him at the bottom. He's not bad. Well, and he's just a very dry sardonic character. Right. Yeah. And Amelia, like, there is one part where I did genuinely laugh at the scene near the end when Ophelia's throwing everything out of her purse and she's like, oh, no, hold on to this and gives him a vibrator. He's like, mm. oh, yeah, let's prioritize that. He doesn't even, like, react in disgust or anything. It's just kind of nonchalantly, like, oh, yeah, sure, priorities. Yeah. <laughs> right. And that's, like, the only part with him I actually laughed at. And he just doesn't deliver any jokes. Like, the rest of it is, like, him being sad about his failed music career and... Otherwise, he's just another guy there. Yeah, he's very dry. To me, it was just really weird seeing Bill Maher play a character that almost could have been played by like Steve Gutenberg or (laughs) one of the other schmucky guys of the time. Well, and I should point out, this was Bill Maher's first movie. That makes sense. I can believe that. Yeah. And he does look very baby-faced. And he only did a handful in the 80s before going into Politically Incorrect. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't really buy him as a struggling musician. Just maybe I'm putting too much of my knowledge of Bill Maher, the person in there. I don't know. He had some funny moments here and there, but he was definitely very dry and just there to sort of be another disgruntled character, I guess. Mm -hmm. The main difference between this and Car Wash, other than the having a deeper plot, is Mm. Car Wash still had that mixture of comedy and drama, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where there was a lot of actual genuine thematic stuff about hardships, you know, working on minimum wage, having to give up your dreams for just having to pay the bills and This film has a couple of moments where they try that, but they Mm -hmm. never quite pull it off. And like, you know, you had Tyrone's big speech about going to college and all that stuff. It never Mm -hmm. quite fully sells. And reading the script, I even tweeted an excerpt from when I was reading the script. There was that big speech that the Bill Maher character has about how we all have dreams, we all have hobbies, we all have interests. But at some point, you realize you've become a cab driver. Mm -hmm. It was a really heartfelt speech on the page, but he doesn't sell it. 
No. You know? And it's an interesting sentiment. But again, that's not really a sentiment that carries on through the film when so many of the other people love being a cab driver. And he's the only one who just really comes off like he doesn't want to be there. He doesn't fit in with everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't mean that in like a mean way. It's just he yeah, right. is someone who ended up stuck here because he literally just ended up in that rut. That was his truth. That wasn't yeah. really everybody else's truth for the film, I guess, right. you know, would be a way to describe it. Because everyone else just feels like they're having fun party. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. There is that part right before Albert puts all his money into the cab company where he's like, you're all trying to run away from becoming a cabbie and I'm the only one who wants to be one or whatever. I'm like, mm -hmm. some of them have like, we really don't know what they want and right. only a couple like really seem to be bummed out by it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll get to Ophelia who has some of that too. But I think the big difference is, is that Car Wash, while it had gags and silliness, was still focused on the daily life, the day-to-day -day grind of working in a car wash. Mm -hmm. Right. And this one, those elements are there, but it's more primarily focused on the gags and the silly characters and the goofy mm -hmm. plot. And this is more of a full-on straight comedy yeah. mm -hmm. than Car Wash is. Car Wash is more just kind of like your indie comedy drama type thing. Mm -hmm. It leads a little more towards comedy, but it still has a large thematic undercurrent of drama, whereas this one is peppered with it, but it's a comedy. It's just a straight-up screwball comedy. Mm -hmm. And I will say it's probably, of all the Joel Schumacher's scripts I've read so far, it's probably the weakest, hmm. but not in a bad way. It's just, again, there's not much underlying thematic elements. It's more just silly gags and stuff. Sure. Mm -hmm. Which isn't bad. Yeah. Angie, who was your least favorite character? Least favorite? I guess Paul Rodriguez's character, hmm. the wannabe gigolo. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not that he was bad. He was what do you just... mean, baby? <laughs> Like, I feel like I've seen Paul Rodriguez do some degree of that character in other oh, yeah. films and TV shows already, oh, God, maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then it's kind of like, okay, dude, like, you think you're hot shit, and, you know. It was all right. It was just kind of a little one note, I guess, so that I wasn't yeah. as amused by it. Yeah, not a character who has really any depth. It's just like, let's just set him up as he's the flashy, fast talker who loves women, who mm -hmm. wants to be a gigolo, but he's really bad at it. So he ended right. up being a cab driver. Mm. Yeah. And basically, there's there's nothing else to his character for the entire mm -hmm. movie. It's just gags. Yep. <laughs> I do like the bit where he escorts the woman out of the club and then she finds out he's a cab driver. It's like, oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> Or even the bit where he's explaining his whole philosophy of wanting to be a gigolo while he's screaming around corners and his passengers are like flying. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was so funny. <laughs> I mean, he's an energetic presence or even like when they all burst into the hospital room pretending to be lawyers, you know? Yeah. He's an entertaining person. But again, there's nothing to his character. He's just part of the comedy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's got the one note and he plays that note relatively well, but it's just there's not a lot to make him stand out amongst some of the better members of the ensemble. And my least favorite, not because I think the performance is bad, because he's very funny at times, but he is definitely the most offensive character, is Gary Busey as Dell. Yeah. Yeah. I have to admit, I did laugh at him, though. The thought that kept coming to mind was when we were watching Andrew Dice Clay in Ford Fairlight. Uh-huh. It's not that it's a bad performance, and there's a lot of funny stuff going on, but it's just the offensiveness of the material can be so overwhelming at times. Yeah, it can. It can. Yeah. Definitely. And especially just the slimy ways he tries to hit on every woman. Mm -hmm. His whole speech about how blacks are taking over the military, so I'm trying to become one of the token whites who they keep around. Except he's not saying blacks. <laughs> no, and he's just going in full-on racist conspiracy theory rant. Yeah. Yeah. I guess every now and then he was so insane that I almost was sort of like, okay, like he's just meant to be the crazy guy. Like, yes, he's offensive, but... He's definitely the Jim Belushi of the movie. Of right, the <laughs> right. And I guess, like I said, once again, because we're in 1983, yeah. it's like you expect there to be that wild, over-the-top, sexist... You would not want to see this yeah. character today. I had to look up and see when Gary Busey had his motorcycle accident. It wasn't right. until a little later after this. It was, yeah, it was before that. But you couldn't tell. I Yeah. <laughs> oh, Gary Busey was always kind of an over-the-top weird actor. He's always insane, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, then that made it even worse. But you definitely have to look at it through the lens of this was like right in the period where you had Animal House and right. Porky's and all right. that stuff. And this was trying to compete with those, mm -hmm. which I don't say to defend it, but you can definitely tell that was in the mindset of that's where exactly. we have to aim to get the money right there are parts i really are genuine laughs i get from him but mm -hmm. then there's the parts that where i'm like that's uncomfortable yeah yeah the whole strip club thing yeah our yeah. token topless strip club scene where he goes mm -hmm. in and rips off her panties to get her tips for the fare she didn't pay right yeah and just steals a random statue or something too <laughs> that was funny <laughs> 
Because it's so out yeah, of nowhere. No, I mean, I get it. But it's like I said, it's one of my favorite quotes is Albert's asks him, do you do drugs, Dell? And he says, I don't remember. I mean, just like <laughs> and his delivery is just so perfect. He plays that part well when he's not being gross. And the problem is that half the time he's being gross. Yeah. Yeah. And he's even hitting on the boss's wife. Right. Even the bit where it's like she kicks them out of the house and she's stolen the money and has locked everyone out. And he's like tapping on the glass. Myrna, let's mm-hmm. run off together. I got a hotel and half a case of Jose Cuervo. <laughs> It's like, really? And I should point out, a lot of that was improvised by Gary Busey. That makes a lot of sense. I can kind of believe that. Yeah. I mean, the character was there, but he really definitely blew it up beyond what was in the script. Mm. Mm. I think he is one of those characters who, again, why does this person still have a job at this company? Right. (laughs) Because what is he adding? What is he bringing to this period? Harold gives people a lot of second chances. That's that's clear. (laughs) Well beyond. Mm. And I think he is one of those ones, if you would cut him down... I would have less hesitancy recommending people go check out this movie. Mm. Yeah. Because a, a lot of this stuff is him. Yeah, it is. I mean, especially that whole speech about, you know, how the blacks are taking over the military. And it really comes out of nowhere. And it goes right back to nowhere. <laughs> yeah, like it doesn't have any purpose. And it's not like the yeah. other people at the company distrust him. He's just... No. What are you doing? Even he's telling that to Albert. And Albert right. isn't even like looking at him side-eyed or reacting. He's just sitting there with a stupid grin on his face because Adam Baldwin isn't capable of retweeting it yet. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for <laughs> There's a uh, lot of people in this movie that like in real life I have a very different opinion of their character. You know? Oh yeah. Oh <laughs> yeah. Like I'm separating a lot here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I mean those are our least favorites. Just because he's probably kind of the least developed to the point where I keep forgetting he's there. We have Dwayne Jesse, a.k.a. Otis Day, as Bongo, the Rastafarian. Oh. The Cleveland Rastafarian. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) And again, that's Otis Day who was like Floyd and Lloyd in Car Wash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's just kind of there. Just pops up every now and then. Couple little jokes. And then the bit where he's pretending to be the doctor in the hospital. Oh, yeah. The shirt. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That cracked me up. Because it worked. Yeah. Yeah. Where he's trying to blend in. And, you know, he's still got the full dreads and and the knit cap. And he's, like, even walking past cops and be like, "Uh uh-oh. And he gets back. (laughs) Yeah, that really tickled me. Just because it, I don't know. I like that kind of absurd, makes no sense, but... (laughs) works anyway and i do also love his one line i have seen the light (laughs) i think that should lead us into probably the most prominent character in the marketing of this movie and in the memory is mr t is yeah (laughs) and i had to look it up so this was like the year of mr t because the end of 1982 sylvester stallone had seen mr t in a reality tv show competition of the world's best bouncer okay because he spent most of the 70s as a bouncer and a bodyguard Mm. and sylvester stallone literally saw him in this reality tv show cast him as clubber lang in rocky 3 which was initially Mm. a small part and then rewrote the script to make him a huge part of the movie okay and that was at the end of 82 at the beginning of 83 is when A-Team debuted. Okay. September of 83 is when the Mr. T animated series debuted. Yes. <laughs> and December of 83 is when this movie debuted. So that was like the year of Mr. T. This was peak Mr. T, yeah. Yeah. Okay. This was, and everything kind of just dropped down. A-Team kept going, but- But wait, when was the serial? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I that was probably around the time of the cartoon. <laughs> probably so. That's something, because I mean, like I said, like I was two at this point, but I don't know, like I just remember, like he stayed a big deal for at least a few years. Yeah. Because I feel like Mr. T was a big part of my childhood in ways oh, yeah. that I can't even entirely explain. And the Mr. T serial was 1984, so the next year. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And 18 was on for like, what, four or five seasons at least. Yeah, I think so. So by that point, we were, you know. Yeah, we were a bit yeah, older, right. Seven, eight. When Mr. T, I think that was probably the most A-list he became came in terms of like he was in a major movie he Mm -hmm. had his own tv show he never quite regained that but he never stopped i mean he's still around he's still he was just on dancing with the stars you know yeah (laughs) he's never lost that persona you know he would guest on everything he did commercials he would do public Mm -hmm. speaking he was at award ceremonies mr t never stopped being around 
I mean, hell, he was in Freak just to be... <laughs> right. But no, I just love that it's like his arc is all about how he's trying to keep these kids away from drugs. Yes. Yes. He's so purely Mr. T. It's Mr. T. Like, that is what he does. He's so charming and sweet and funny and... <laughs> yeah. He is. Yeah, he nailed his persona down. Like, he said this is probably, what, his second film? And was that, like, in his contract that he has to have that <laughs> speech about protecting kids and stay in school? And Yeah, that's what... Mr. T was really like even before he became famous. Because mm-hmm. even when he was working as a bouncer and a bodyguard, he was also doing, you know, youth support programs and lectures. And he was more about, you know, teaching people to break up fights instead of getting into them. Mm-hmm. There were times when people, because he was a bodyguard, actually tried to hire him to be a hitman. Mm. <laughs> And he would turn them instantly over to the police and all that stuff. You barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> well, and even yeah. his appearance, I was surprised to learn the origin of all the gold chains around his neck. Hmm. As a bouncer, if anyone lost a necklace or something at the club, he would just put it on so that they could just reclaim it from him without having to go back into the club. Aww. He's like a walking <laughs> lost and found. <laughs> and then they would just kind of gradually build up as people wouldn't come back for them, you know? Yeah. And that just became part of his persona. And I know that's actually something he stopped doing lately because he felt, you know, that putting on tons of jewelry is looking down on people who, you know, are not able to afford it, sure. given that those are the communities he's trying to help. Right. But I mean, yeah, that this was like after his animated series where it's literally like Mr. T is a bus driver driving around a bunch of school kids who saw mysteries. <laughs> yeah. So was he in the script this way? Like, did they write the role for Mr. T? They wrote this for Mr. T. Okay. Okay. I can't imagine. And that he's trying to get all the kids to stop hanging around this pimp who's got the flashy car Mm -hmm. and you know even his niece rides in the car and then I love how he gets the whole tricked out cab with even the little airplane beanie on top and (laughs) and it's like suddenly (laughs) everyone just loves his car so cool Mr. T is so wonderful in this movie Mm -hmm. what I love is that so much of Mr. T he's just you know very stone faced and gruff and you know stay in school and all that stuff in this one you have that but you also have scenes where he's smiling and laughing (laughs) and dancing Dancing and running around mm-hmm. with everyone. Yeah. So much of this cast, you can tell how much fun they're having. Yeah. Right. And seeing Mr. T being that happy <laughs> is so wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he's not like a big part of the film itself. Plot wise, but he's always there. Yeah. But he makes such an impression. I'm not a bit surprised at why he was marketed so heavily. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm looking at the poster on Wikipedia and it's him holding up the DC cab logo on right. the car door. And it's like, oh, yeah. he makes the biggest impression out of all the cast. Yeah. And that he never really like overwhelms everyone else but he's such a part of it and he's just so fun especially like even at the end when they're having the parade and you know him Mm -hmm. and the other two are just dancing up on the thing and he's smiling and laughing and Mm -hmm. i want more happy mr t right i want a whole like account that's just dedicated to gifts of laughing mr t (laughs) (laughs) not that i don't love you know stone face stay in school mr t but it's so fun (laughs) seeing him having fun yeah yeah and speaking of fun, this is when we get to Peter Paul and David Paul, the Barbarian Brothers. Never heard of them. <laughs> A pair of identical twin bodybuilder in the <laughs> Where did they find these guys? Please tell me. <laughs> Yeah, I need the origin. <laughs> they were very much in the wake of, you know, like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Lou Ferrigno. They very much were sure. part of that circle. Mm-hmm. And they were noted for being identical twins, too. Mm. As Lou Ferrigno and Schwarzenegger were becoming like big name stars, it's like, hey, who else can we get from that camp? And that's how we got like Sven Thorson and stuff like that. And then you got the Paul brothers. And uh, Angie, what would you think of Buddy and Buzzy? They're, I mean, they're really charming. They're <laughs> not the best actors in the world, yeah. obviously, but they have a nice comedic edge to them and they clearly play off each other very well. And they're just big, lovable, goofy guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're slabs of meathead, literally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh yeah, jd what do you think of them i love them so much i lied I, I am familiar with the barbarian brothers but to be honest if it wasn't for the fact there were two of them i probably wouldn't have recognized them because they don't have their mullets yet no yeah this is where they're going for that bearded lou ferrigno look that was popular in the <laughs> early 80s yeah 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 but i agree with angie they're just super charming like when they're telling the story of like the guy who their brother-in-law who gets cut in half it's like <laughs> such a disgusting story, but the way they deliver it is just so earnest and like chipper. They're like two 12 year old kids just talking over each other. Yeah, exactly. I just was like, I like these guys. I want to hang out with these guys. 
my favorite <laughs> scene in the entire movie, which I've gone back to re- just rewatch this scene because it makes me laugh every time, is when they're looking for the farmhouse and Bruce Lee. And they pull <laughs> up to the farmhouse that has Bruce Lee, L E I G H, on the mailbox. Yes. And cut to this lovely little casual decor dining room, you know, parents, children, grandparents, all sitting around a dining table. Mr. T and the Barbarian Brothers come smashing through the doors and the windows, just destroying it. Look up, see this family staring at them. And Mr. T's like, sorry, ma'am, wrong house. And they just burst right back out. I like the build up to it, too, where they're like, but that says Bruce Leg. And they're like, I told you to stay in school. (laughs) But just that one shot, that Uh, one locked camera shot in the dining room, this family eating, these three Titanic men just mash in and just leave this devastation in their way because they're like, sorry, wrong house. (laughs) And I believe Mr. T breaks the frame again as he goes out. He literally kicks the (laughs) frame. And the grandmother just like goes back to eating her stuff. (laughs) You know, we entered this project wondering, is Joel Schumacher a good director? (laughs) That scene alone is probably one of my favorite sequences that I've seen. (laughs) It's a sign. It's a sign, people. He's got some talent. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And oh my God, I just, even when I rewatched the film again, like on Thursday, I had to rewind and watch that scene a couple more times. (laughs) Just the way it's paced, the way it's shot, it's just, oh my God, is that hysterical. And it's like they burst in and then they all just trip over each other and then they're just kind of all trying to get up. It's great physical comedy. (laughs) And everyone's just sitting there like, what? (laughs) (laughs) The fact that this did not lead to a TV series starring Mr. T and the Barbarian Brothers, (laughs) where they open like their own detective agency or something like that. (laughs) Um, I want to see those three together. Even like, you know, the bit where they're like cleaning up the company and getting new cars and new uniforms. I love the great shot of the three of them leading an exercise routine. (laughs) I want more Mr. T and the Barbarian Brothers together. It's not too late world. (laughs) And then there's Ophelia. Yes. She's an intro. She's the woman of the group. She's the one who is obviously the most tired of putting up with all the shit, mm-hmm. but not in like a bitter Tyrone way. She's just exhausted by it. She's constantly being held up by this one guy. Every time she wants to leave the company and go into this other one, which would pay better and have better job security, Harold's always talking her out of it. It's an odd character because you can see that she still cares about these people and wants to be part of this group. But they even have the line where she has a kid at home. She needs to think about what's going to actually help her in the future. And they never really ultimately confront that other than she just stays with the group. No, she's very much a straight woman Yeah, for this madcap group of characters. Yeah. Yeah, they never explain why the other cab company wants her so badly other than the fact that she's apparently like the only sane member of the cast. Yeah, well, and they say that she's the best driver and she's the most toned yeah. down of the group in terms of being a person, you know? Yeah, it's just, I don't understand like what the best driver means in a cab company, you know? So like they never explain anything. Well, you're not being the rest of this company. <laughs> I bet it's, I think it's because she's not insane. That's <laughs> right. probably the yeah. main she's thing. She's not crashing yeah. stuff. She's not conning people out of fares. She knows all the routes. She knows the business. I guess. She does pretty well. And that's why probably whenever that guy holds her up, he's probably getting a pretty decent amount of money. Yeah. Yeah. I will say too, it was just really exciting for me to realize that this was Marsha Warfield from Night Court. Mm-hmm. It mm-hmm. took me a little bit to recognize oh, her, but I was like, oh my right. God. <laughs> Yeah. I used to love Night Court so much. I'm glad to see she's still around and still acting to this day. Mm. She does a lot of theater. Cool. That's awesome. I especially love the bit where the company is finally doing well and they're flourishing and she just has that really stylish outfit with the coat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She's a really interesting person, but again, they never really quite figure out how to fully handle her. And again, I think they make Harold a little oppressive. I think the character makes sense in terms of she has loyalty to this group and to Harold, and that's what's keeping her here, even though she knows she'll be better off somewhere else. But they do overly make it about him pressuring her into it. Yeah, he's way too forceful in that scene. I wish there was a little more to that in terms of like, why does she have this loyalty to these slunkheads, you know? Mm -hmm. I do love the scene where they finally, and it's not her, it's Albert that does it, where they finally catch the guy who keeps holding her up. Yeah. I just love that whole bit of like, guy puts the gun to his head, so his instinct is to hit the gas. And (laughs) 
Tyrone is like, what the hell are you doing in the back? And he's like, if you shoot me now, we're going fast enough, it'll kill you. And then they get to the cab company and everyone is armed for war. <laughs> I even do like some of the jokes where it's like the guy gives the gun to Tyrone and the cops jump on Tyrone because they do make a good point out of that. And right. A little thematic beat out of it. And then she gets that final kick to the nuts to the guy who's been holding her up all this time. Mm -hmm. There's a lot going on in that scene, but I like how all of it's layered in really well. Mm -hmm. I think that shows some of the strength of Schumacher is a storyteller in terms of how he can really pile a lot into a scene and it never really loses its way. So I think we got all of the main cast. Mm -hmm. Some of the other ones, like we have Myrna. She's kind of a stereotypical put upon wife in a lot mm -hmm. of ways, I guess. Like we get that clearly she's aggravated, but I don't really feel like we see anything that Harold's done to justify it. So yeah. she just comes off, man, like, just calm down, lady. <laughs> like, She's kind know? of the trope of the nag. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the whole thing that, you know, his idea to do with the reward money is to split it with everyone else. And she's mm -hmm. like, no, it's ours, you know. And Right. I don't know that you needed the whole plot twist of her sleeping with the hack inspector. No. But it was funny. <laughs> it was fun to see him get thrown in the pool. Yeah. 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 And we should mention uh, Ernesto Bravo, the hack inspector, mm -hmm. who's always busting everyone's chops and is always on everyone's cases. Not unrightfully so, because <laughs> again, Tyrone is a shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, then the whole revelation that he's sleeping with Harold's wife and there's no real payoff for him other than he no. kind of has to begrudgingly reward everyone in the end. Right. Mm -hmm. But I do like him in the little bikini briefs and getting tossed in that pool. Mm -hmm. Trying to think any other characters. Mr. Rhythm. Mr. Rhythm. Yes. I can't really tell if he's homeless or if he's just one of the old drivers or something, but he kind of like lives in one of the wrecked cars. He seems to be homeless. Yeah. yeah, I think he's just a homeless guy who lives in one of the wrecked cars outside of the cab company. Yeah, he's just taken up residence there and has just become part of the family. Right. Yeah. He should have got the $10,000. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I hope they bought him a better cab. <laughs> right? <laughs> I liked him. He doesn't add a whole lot to the plot. He's a fun, just kooky character coming up with all these constant sayings that they charge his money for. <laughs> like, don't let your dick run your life. Yeah. You know, it's a good piece of advice. I think some people need to listen to that advice, but I don't know that I necessarily need to pay 25 cents for that. <laughs> But, I, you know, he's fine. Yeah, I like the fact that he's the old kooky guy that just lives at the cab place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, watching him play a violin worth half a million dollars like a <laughs> like fiddle is was... amusing, you know. <laughs> yeah. And then the bit where the two other cab drivers, like, try to citizens arrest him. And he just runs off. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, the, he's the one because he stayed behind that Albert calls in the end. Yeah. Right. So getting into some of the other plot threads, there were the two drivers from the rival cab company who just always show up to just give people crap. Mm -hmm. They were funny. Yeah. I especially love how they get their cab stolen at the end. Yeah. <laughs> And I do love the whole bit of, you know, they're constantly chasing our heroes away from the airport because our heroes don't have airport licenses. And I love that one scene where they bring over the cops to our heroes and it's like, oh, look at these. We got airport licenses now. <laughs> and then, Angie, what would you think of Albert's romance with the waitress? Uh, <laughs> I mean, their romance was built on smiling at each other from across yeah. the room. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the theme song was playing, so I guess that means it must be true love. Right. It very much felt like we need to have some kind of romantic angle in this movie, so here it is. Yeah. I was a little weirded out when she says, oh, when I turn 18, this May, yes. <laughs> and immediately I looked up, Adam Baldwin was probably about- He was like 20, 21 at the time. Yeah, he was mm. probably about 21 when it was filmed, so it's not that big of an age difference, but it still feels really weird, because Adam Baldwin is a big guy. Well, they were never really clear on how old Albert was supposed to be. Right, and right. You know, it could just be like he's fresh out of high school, moved right. to the big city. Yeah, I can believe that. But Adam Baldwin is like a big guy. So he doesn't look <laughs> like some guy who just got out of high school. He looks like mm -hmm. a guy in his 20s. And I don't know, that just really kind of like, okay, I'm just going to walk away from this. <laughs> yeah. And then what's interesting is you have the whole, you know, she has the, is her aunt or her grandma? Grandmother. That was the more age distraction for me was they kept calling it her grandma. And I'm like, there's yeah. no way that woman is her grandma. Yeah. Where, you know, she's like <laughs> this whole reckless group of cabbers come into her diner every night. She'll be damned if she lets one of them date her daughter. Mm -hmm. You know, she puts up the whole wall of, I'm waiting for a successful man to come in, box of chocolates, ask my permission, all stuff. And then Albert does it. Well, you know, it does put her behind the wall of having to get someone else's permission to go in a relationship. 
I think it works better than the TC scene in Car Wash, where he's like, you're waiting for some knight in shining armor to come in here. Well, you're going to have to settle for me. Mm -hmm. I think it worked better here because they at least established that the waitress was as interested in him too. Right. Right. And it's not about forcing her to conform. It's about getting the grandmother to let go of her impossible standards that she's using to restrict her granddaughter. Yeah. He's improving with his romantic angles that he's writing. (laughs) Yes. And we'll see where he gets by cousins. Mm -hmm. Mm. Coming soon. (laughs) (laughs) But again, yeah, it's a romance doesn't really continue to play. Though I do like, you know, when the whole kidnap angle, which we'll get to in a minute, the whole kidnap angle happens and you cut back to the diner where the grandmother shuts off the TV. She gives Harold a supportive pat on the shoulder. So it's like, is she actually Mm -hmm. on Albert's side instead of buying into the BS that he's a kidnapper too? Right. Maybe he's one over the grandma too. Mm Mm-hmm. So, J.D., yes. what did you think about the whole kidnap the children of the ambassadors plot? <laughs> I have to admit, I had been watching this film. I had no idea where this was going. And all of a sudden, there's a kidnapping plot out of this screwball <laughs> comedy that was not expecting. Maybe I should have been because the opening was pretty dark, too. Mm-hmm. Not mm-hmm. that this was super dark per se, but it did really kind of throw me for a loop. I enjoyed it. I appreciate that it upped the stakes a little bit and also allowed, because most of the film is basically Albert just hanging out with these like one or two cabbies. Is this your first time being kidnapped? It's our third. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The kids are great. This is all of a sudden, everybody comes together as a team. And Mm -hmm. I think that's the best part is when you get to see all these characters playing off of each other, like when they're pretending to be lawyers for the one housekeeper they're so funny as an ensemble and most of the film it's they're not really an ensemble except for a few parts here and there and then all of a sudden it becomes a true ensemble and I think that's where it really shines hey, Angie what I loved is because you know we talked about in Car Wash how there was you know the Coke Bottle Bomber which ended up mm. not really being a thing right right and then in Amateur Night at the Dixie Bar and Grill you know there was <laughs> the gunman who would burst into nightclubs that everyone thought this one guy was but he completely wasn't completely nothing right and how I made a joke about how so what's going to be the fake <laughs> up in in dc cab and it's like oh no Mm -hmm. we're actually gonna have this actually happen and play out (laughs) right well they did start it off where you thought he was being pursued by these people and then it was really just them goofing off but but yeah Yeah. like there is an actual kidnapping group and everything yeah yeah so what did you think of the whole kidnapping subplot I remember like I was literally sitting there going, why is this nun taking pictures of this house? Why is she still here? And then I was like, oh, okay, that's why she's here. (laughs) You know, it kind of came out of nowhere, but I think it was amusing enough. The kids look like they're cosplaying Harry Potter and Hermione (laughs) long before (laughs) those characters existed. I thought the same thing. (laughs) But they're really cute. They put me in Gryffindor, but I'm really a Hufflepuff. (laughs) (laughs) They're so nonchalant about it. And it's a good way to bring everybody together. Mm -hmm. And so it works, you know, even though it's kind of out of nowhere. It raises the stakes really well because, again, everyone thinks he's a kidnapper. So that's enough that they can actually get the DC cab company shut down. Mm -hmm. And they literally have to steal their own cabs in order to go do this. And (laughs) everyone trying to figure out, so what's the farmhouse by the airport with Bruce Lee? What does that mean? (laughs) (laughs) Right. And then, yeah, that it leads to bits like the whole crashing into the farmhouse, you know, or Mm. or I love that they literally just held the camera on Adam Baldwin and were like, okay, figure out how to get out of a rope. (laughs) (laughs) It did go on a while. They cut it in half with a scene, but it's literally like two minutes of Adam Baldwin struggling to break free from a rope and he takes off the blindfold and here's the two kids already 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 (laughs) inside themselves going, yay, you did it. Okay. (laughs) Oh, God. I love... (laughs) It's a funny movie. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It is. And then even the cab company finds the right farmhouse, and they line up outside like police cars pretending to be cops. (laughs) Yep. I especially love when, like, everything goes down. Mr. T's little shuffle dance trying to avoid the guns. (laughs) (laughs) And, yeah, then, of course, the big car chase where they're trying Mm -hmm. to get Albert out and because he's wearing his daddy's oversized boots. <laughs> mm-hmm. And either they have really good green screen or they actually had those actors actually hanging out of the car windows. And I'm kind of shocked you couldn't get away with that because you could tell those aren't stunt doubles, at least not right. all the time. No, but the vehicles are on a rig, so they're not going to go further apart or from each other. And there is a ground beneath them if they yeah, fall. Okay. And he's also probably on a safety harness. That's actually not uncommon. Yeah, but it just I was kind of impressed that this little $7 million like comedy from like the early 80s they actually are 
doing that. That's kind of impressive. Like, you know, a rig is not that big of a deal, but it looked good. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I do also love the whole reveal of the drive-in movie screen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then they pay that off again by having the bad guys crash into the drive-in movie screen. Right. Slowly fall over. <laughs> yeah. But then I also love the whole Mr. T speech in front of the <laughs> Lincoln Memorial. Oh, yes. Where the camera does the rack focus revealing Lincoln yes! Biden and he turns around and salutes it. <laughs> Once again, Joel Schumacher, great director. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely great comedic director. Yeah. And also, because you mentioned that opening sequence, what I love, and God, this was great on the page too, is it literally opens like a sci fi movie with like <laughs> a field of stars. You hear the voice, is anyone out there? And then this giant, looming, mechanical thing comes in and blocks the starlight. And we're just like scrolling across all these weird, bedraggled, hanging parts of like some giant, rotted old spaceship passing over us. And then the camera comes up and it's a cab <laughs> that we've been looking at the underside of. And then it switches into a horror movie. It's like The Purge, you know, yeah. these weird guys in rubber masks in cabs chasing after another cab driver, cornering him in an alley. And then it turns into a comedy. And from then on, it's comedy. Mm -hmm. I love just how much he plays with tone and style there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm trying to think, did Joel Schumacher ever do a sci-fi movie? I don't think so. No way Batman is science fiction. (laughs) Well, yeah. (laughs) I mean, I don't know. (laughs) And then, you know, Flatliners kind of toes the line. But I mean, he's never done like Mm -hmm. a future space or even like a cyberpunk-y type thing. Right. I would love to see Joel Schumacher do cyberpunk. Seriously, I think he's got the perfect aesthetic for that. Yeah, I mean, he certainly got the style, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a shame. God, imagine him like doing William Gibson <laughs> in the late 80s or early 90s. God, that mm-hmm. would have been great. But anyways, <laughs> the direction of this is really, really well done. I should point out the cinematographer, Dean Cundy. I was shocked to see his name here. This is John Carpenter's cinematographer. Oh, okay. This is the guy who shot Halloween, The Fog, Escape from New York, Big Trouble in Little China. <laughs> and it's like right after this is when he was blowing up into the A-list leagues, he became Robert Zemeckis' cinematographer and did like Romancing the Stone, Back to the Future, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and then became Spielberg's cinematographer <laughs> and did like Hook and Jurassic Park. I mean, like this guy was one of the great cinematographers of the 80s. It's not an overly stylized movie. Everything is kind of very simple setups and all stuff, but it's still very well done. And when it does something stylistic, it does it really well. Mm -hmm. And sadly, ever since Jurassic Park, it's been kind of a downward slope. He's been doing like Garfield and Adam Sandler movies. Mm. From Back to the Future Mm. to whatever that one was where it's the identical twin Adam Sandlers. Oh, God. I don't want to remember. (laughs) Jack and Jill. Jack and Jill. Oh, God. But yeah, no, I think the film is designed. It's the same costume designer who did Incredible Shrinking Woman. Okay. I just think there's a really good look to the movie. Again, I have to correct myself. When we started this project, I said, you know, what I usually think of as Joel Schumacher's visual style is the Batman movies are kind of a step out, but I always thought of him Mm. as kind of like a little bit more of a monochrome, kind of a Mm. muted stylist. But Incredible Shrinking Woman had, you know, that varied and vibrant color palette. This has a lot of variety and colors and textures, Mm -hmm. and there's just a lot of striking design in this. I like the fact that you can tell, like, the good guys and the bad guys for the cab companies, because they're all wearing yellow, and the bad guys are all the green cabs, and it's just like, those are two bright standout colors, and especially once they get the revamp of the cars, like, they're all just stand out so distinctly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And everyone has such a unique look to them. Mm -hmm. Everyone really stands out really well in their own individual ways. God, the colors that Mr. T wore. (laughs) He probably did his own costumes, knowing yeah. him. <laughs> <laughs> There's one where I think it's when he's confronting the pimp for the first time where he's got like an orange top and green tights on. Mm. I'm like, oh, my God, Mr. T is the hobgoblin. <laughs> I'm going to get that sputter man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I love it because you just don't see that stuff anymore. Like you don't see like these bright clashing colors. And I kind of miss some of that to a degree because real life is not usually like a mono palette that a lot of films go to. Right. Mm-hmm. See, and my memory was that he was kind of one of the pioneers for what's kind of been overused in the modern day of, you know, like everything's kind of tinted blue or tinted orange. Mm. And my memory is we will kind of get to that because I'm remembering like some of the stuff he did in the 90s, like 8 millimeter and the client all that mm. stuff. But again, that's sure. my 
memory and I haven't seen those in a long time. So, cause you know, I really liked his designs in the seventies. I mm-hmm. really liked how amateur night was designed. I really loved how incredible shrinking woman was designed. I really like how this is designed. I'm going to be just really curious to see what the look is of his films as they continue going along. Mm-hmm. And I should point out the production designer, John Lloyd, also from Carpenter, he's the same guy who did The Thing and Big Trouble in Little China, both of which were very strikingly designed movies. Hmm. Okay. And also the Blues Brothers mm. <laughs> and Jaws of Revenge. This time it's personal. <laughs> <laughs> Angie, anything else leaping out at you in terms of like Joel in terms of style and technique in this one? No, I mean, I was just kind of impressed by the sheer variety of it. Like, you know, the car chases, the wacky comedy, the little horror bit at the beginning, Mm -hmm. just showing him like really flex all of those muscles that we saw a little bit in Shrinking Woman with its kind of zaniness, but definitely much more fully developed here. And it's a really well put together film in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember back when we were doing Car Wash, just kind of wondering, what's this going to be like when Joel is directing these himself? Mm-hmm. We've gotten two ensemble pieces now, Amateur Night and this. And I think yeah. Yeah, he can do it just fine on his own, too. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I don't think anything would have really been gained by if like this were directed by like, say, Michael Schultz again. Right. Yeah. And in fact, I think there's certain visual things and style things and little moments that Joel is actually pulling off that I've even seen Schultz struggle with. Mm -hmm. Even though this is probably not one of his biggest, most prominent films, we're just like about to move into his two big films that launched him. But you're already seeing a really polished and honed director. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The further we get into this project, the more I'm becoming a fan of Joel Schumacher. (laughs) (laughs) that's what you hope for right (laughs) yeah because you know we came into this with a lot of unknowns because you and i were still just Mm -hmm. don't know much about every little film i see so far is just i love this guy (laughs) (laughs) oh the music you know i do like the soundtrack for the most part the irene car song kind of sucks but i love the song Mm -hmm. playing over the opening credits i can't remember what it's called but i I can't remember it right now yeah all I can hear is do 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 My only main problem is that Giorgio Moroder, who was one of the big synth guys in the day, most of this movie is soundtrack. It's actual songs. But every now and then you'd cut to his score and it literally just sounds like someone kind of randomly banging on a Casio. Especially like during the big chase scene at the end and all that stuff. It's not really that good of a score. Maybe you're familiar with it, Noel, but there is one song that is credited to Gary Busey called Why Baby Why. I couldn't place it in the movie at all. I just saw it in the credits. Might have just been one that he was just kind of randomly singing off to the side. Maybe he was just riffing, yeah. Well, I mean, Gary Busey was a musician before he was an actor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well. That's how he got the Buddy Holly story. Okay, yeah. That makes sense, I guess. Like, maybe it's that song that he's playing in his own cab. Could be. When he's, like, cranking it up to 11 or whatever, when it shatters the windows. So the main theme of the movie, DC Cab, performed by Pia Boo Bryson. <laughs> I don't know who that is, but I know they played it during the opening credits and it came up later on. I think it's Peebo Bryson, I think. He did Beauty and the Beast. He sang with Celine Dion, I oh, think. Oh, really? Okay. Because I did like that song. You got DeBarge on the soundtrack. Oh, really? Yeah. That's not surprising. It's the 80s. I think DeBarge was on every other soundtrack. Yeah. Right. Uh, And it's surprising that it's not a a Motown production. (laughs) (laughs) God, imagine Joel Schumacher's The Last Dragon. I don't, uh, nah, I'm good. (laughs) (laughs) What would he do with show enough? Ooh. (laughs) Anyway, so anything else either of you can think of for a DC cab? No, I think we covered everything. Still all recommend it? Yeah, I had fun. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I'm even less on the fence than I was when I started. Because again, I think there's just like Mm -hmm. a few specific bits, most of which are Gary Busey, a few Tyrone. Right. I mean, I think as long as you go into it realizing this is a 1983 screwball comedy. Yeah. And that there's going to be some poor taste involved occasionally. I'll be honest, I even find the strip scene kind of funny. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this was like that period where films were allowed to be a little raunchy and stuff, but Mm -hmm. before the PC movement had come into place. And I mean, I'm glad that we don't do this as often, but I kind of can't fault it too much because there's a lot of films around that time that do a lot worse than this film, to be honest. Right, yeah. I'll be honest, most of my problem isn't even so much the raunchiness, because some of it is really funny. It's the racism. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I don't know how much to put on Joel because he wrote that character to be a crazy bug nut racist. Mm. But just the way that scene is played, they don't quite sell that he's kind of a loon talking out of his gourd. 
It just comes right. out of nowhere and you could have just cut it. It doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. And there's that scene when Tyrone, when Ernesto breaks the Chinese restaurant window yes. and you see Tyrone. And he goes by doing the Oriental face. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That where I was like, ooh, did not take long for the blatant racism to kick in. Yeah. I'm glad that they didn't mm-hmm. keep doing stuff like that other than the Dell scene. Hey, those are the two moments that cut those out. Everything right. else. Yeah. I recommend this movie. Yeah. Yeah. So box office release. This film cost $7 million to make. Came out on December 16th, 1983. So its first week, DC Cab opened at number nine. Ooh. Right behind John Carpenter's Christine hmm. at number eight. This was the week that Two of a Kind and Uncommon Valor came out, even though none of those were doing too well. The big ones were Terms of Endearment and Scarface, and those had already been out for a few weeks. In its second week, DC Cab dropped to number 10, below Yentl. <laughs> in its third week, oh, Return of the Jedi is still out at the time. So in its third week, nothing else opened, and it's still 10. Okay. In its fourth week, it's down to number 11, and nothing else new opened. It's literally like Terms of Endearment, Sudden Impact, and Scarface just keep circling the one and three slot. Hmm. This is not a very exciting intro to this. <laughs> okay, so in its fifth week. DC Cab is down to number 14, and Hot Dog the Movie opened. What? That was another raunchy comedy. And then okay. Angel about a schoolgirl prostitute on a quest for revenge. Mm-hmm. Okay. And by its sixth, I can't remember for sixth or seventh, DC Cab no longer appears on the box office. So this was a pretty <laughs> bad return to the format. <laughs> yeah. This was the era when Scarface, Return of the Jedi, and Yentl were out, and nothing else mm-hmm. was really doing much else. None of these films yeah. had opened, opened at number one. Right. And Terms of Endearment is ruling the box office. And I mean, you know, like staying like 9, 10, 11, it was at least yeah. like it wasn't like it appeared and then disappeared yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. It was holding fairly steady. That's not bad to do when you're against Scarface. Right, right. <laughs> and it's just a screwball comedy. Yeah. There's probably not as high expectations for it. Mm-hmm. And again, it started at $7 million and ultimately grows 16 So that's more than twice its budget. Yep. So it did fine. And if I remember, it became a kind of staple on HBO Showtime for quite some time afterwards. I wonder what a basic cable TV edit movie this is like. <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously, you got to take out the whole strip club scene. Which means you can also just cut the entire Gary Busey rant because that was part of that scene. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So not much of a release to talk about on this one. Yeah. You let me down, box office mojo. <laughs> Anyways, that's all I have on DC Cap. JD, thanks for joining us on this one. Well, thank you for having me, Noel. No problem. We'll never hear from you again. Nope, never. <laughs> Ninja Vanish. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Angie, good night. Good night. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot dot com. Schumacast can also be found on Stitcher. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended.